actually use the children's sermon as part of the first service. So when I get to that point in the sermon, I'm going to say, remember that, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Today's text is Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, saying, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Let's pray. Now, Lord, open our hearts to your word and your spirit. That we may rejoice in you, be strengthened in you, and in your word. Let us live by your love and your word and your grace. Let us walk with you, Lord. Let us give our hearts to you. That you may be glorified in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus says, if you knew. If you knew who I was, you would be asking me for water. If you knew who I was, you would be asking me for life. Jesus says, if you knew who I was, you would beg for forgiveness. If you knew who I was, you would cling to me and cry. Now, this woman at this well was not dumb, and she was not stupid. She was not evil or mean. This woman was simply spiritually ignorant. She did not know Jesus, who Jesus was, because she did not know God. So the question becomes, if Jesus stood before you today, would you know him? And too often we say, oh, well, I've never seen him, so how could I know him? The reality is you have. You see him in his word. You see his heart and his actions. You see the Spirit of God as he works. You've seen him. The question is, do we know him? Would you be able to know Jesus if he appeared today? Spiritual ignorance. What do we mean by spiritual ignorance? Well, first of all, it's a lack of understanding God and our relationship to him truth is, how well do you know God? If someone asks you, what is God like? Could you answer them more than just the cliche, well, God is love, or John 3.16? Could you answer them in depth? Could you talk to them about who God is, what it meant that he created the world, that he formed you out of the ground, that he called you by name? that he is just and holy and yet merciful and loving? Could you talk about God? Do we really know God and our relationship to him? Because so often we don't. We have an idea, but we never develop that. We never grow in that relationship with God. The second part of spiritual ignorance, it comes from a cavalier attitude about the word of God. That the word of God is something that can be taken or not taken or used or not used, but it's not there. I mean, there are too many churches in our world today, in America today especially, that have little or no understanding of God's word and honestly little are used for it. They don't care. And we didn't even talk about ourselves. If I challenged you right now, which one of you could tell me all ten commandments in order, how well do you think you'd do if I challenge you to list, give me five Bible verses off the top of your head, I'll give you John 3.16, okay? Most everyone's got that one down. If I challenge you five Bible verses, how many of you could do it? If I challenged you to share what God has done in your life lately, what you've learned from your Bible study or your reading, could you answer that? Because the truth is that most Ignorance of God's word today is by choice. The truth is people don't want to know what God's word says. Listen to what Jesus says to the people in Matthew. For this people's hearts have grown dull, and their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal you. Do these words describe you? 
Can these words describe us? Because the, we've heard it so often that we sit in church and we're dull. We don't really listen because we've heard it before. We don't really strive to take hold of God's word. Do we treat God's word like it means so little? Or do we understand that God's word is the very word of life? It is life itself. That's what the Bible tells us. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word you shall live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. Get that? This word you shall live. It is your life. Or David says, I like this, when my soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. God's word gives life. Or in Philippians, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We holding fast to the word of life. Is that something that we hold on to? Charles Spurgeon said this. I thought it was great. We are busy about a thousand things, but we're sluggish about our souls. Spiritual ignorance is defined by a casual effort at obedience and holiness. That our idea of obeying God and be living a holy life is there when we want it and not where we want it, and it's just a hit and miss type of thing. And then Jesus reminds us, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the river rose, the winds blew and pounded on that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the river rose, the wind blew and pounded on that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. How often do we see people that seem like they've got their life built on God they 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 we they seem to have things together in their life everything seems to be working and then something happens a problem or a situation or dispute or whatever and their whole house collapsed because there wasn't anything underneath there we can put on a show folks it was a lot real good all of us can what matters is the foundation we're built on spiritual ignorance word spir- uh, ignorant of the word of god Ignorant of seeking to be, walk with him, obey him, and live in holiness. That's what we're talking about. So what does spiritual ignorance produce? What does it produce in life? Number one, it keeps you in bondage to Satan. This woman was literally in bondage to Satan, this woman at the well. She was trapped, not because of actions, but because of ignorance. She did not know the freedom that God had for her. She did not know the power of God to overcome sin in her situation. She did not know that there was another way. I've seen this so many times over the years. People racked with guilt, who feel overcome with fear, worry, doubt, self-condemnation. For many people, that's the only life they know. They've done it their whole lives. And they think it's got to be this way. And Satan has them bound. Satan has them trapped because they're ignorant. They do not know what God has for them. They do not know the freedom, the forgiveness that God has. Are you trapped? Are you bound? Do you feel like there's no way out? That's Satan, folks. That's Satan that traps you. 
God promises there is always a way with him. He always will guide us out. Second of all, it allows Satan to easily deceive us. I guess it was about 15 years ago. It's been a while now. Um, I read an article, and it was talking about Jehovah Witness and Mormons when they were really going door to door a lot more than they even do now. It talked about the fact that their goal was not to find unbelievers. The goal was to find people who had gone to church as a youth or went to church infrequently now and didn't know very much because then they could take what they knew and twist it to what they wanted it to be. And they found that these made the best converts to, to the heresy of Jehovahism or Mormonism. People who had just enough knowledge to be dangerous, but not enough knowledge to know the truth. It's so true. Satan deceives us just like Adam and Eve. He deceives us by twisting the word of God. And if we don't know the word of God, we fall for it every time. If we're not grounded in the word of God, Satan can, can attack us. I mean, he does it to your children, your grandchildren. I mean, that's why Satan so works hard in our schools. Because most parents, no offense, or grandparents, daily speak to their kid and work with their children about, uh, about faith. But I guarantee you, Satan works every single day to pull your child away from God. Every single day. And we need to understand that. Satan can convince of the lies if we don't know and are not grounded in the Word of God. The third thing it does, it prevents you from knowing the will of God. We don't know the will of God because we don't know God. If we're not growing and focused on the will of God, if we're not seeking to try to live in obedience to God's word, guess what? You're not going to know the word of God. You're not going to know his will. How can you expect to know God's will in the small things if we don't understand God's will in the big things? You know, I've had people come to me, should I marry this person or not marry this person? Should I take this job? Should I not take this job? Should I make this move? Should I not make this move? And my question is always the same. Are you doing the things you know you should do? Because then God will make those things clear. The problem is we don't want to do the things we know God calls us to do, what he tells us to do in the Bible, what he tells us to do with the Word of God, what he tells us to do in the Ten Commandments. We don't want to obey those, but we want God to tell us what to do in the small things. If you haven't done the big things, you're not going to know God's will in the small things. Number four, it keeps you from the blessings of God because spiritual ignorance keeps you from asking for the things that God wants you to ask for. If you don't know what God has for you, you don't know what to ask for it. I remember a story about a woman who went, died and went to heaven and she got interested in a mansion and she found this one room. And in this room were all these beautifully wrapped presents. And she starts over there. I got her name on it. So she starts opening them. And she says, oh, wow, I could have used this when I was alive. Man, that would have been great. No, oh, wow, I could have used that. She's opened up. Finally, she goes to God and says, God, why are all these things up here? Why weren't they given to me when I was on earth when I could have used them? And God's answer was simple. You never asked. If we don't know what God has available for us, we don't know the promises of the Word of God, you're never going to ask. And you miss out on the blessings of God. We do not know the power and the gifts that God has for us. We do not know God himself. And spiritual ignorance keeps us from that. I mean, think about this. Jesus was standing this far in front of this woman, and she had no clue who he was. Even though the whole conversation's going on, no clue. Because you didn't know God. If you don't know God, you miss God. I mean, think about your own life. How many times have you been in a problem or a situation or frustrated, and you ask, where is God? And the truth is, God's standing there right next to you the whole time. But we don't see him. Because we're ignorant. Number three. That's the case. Why do we have spiritual ignorance? Why do we allow it? And the truth is, it allows us to keep living in our sin. My ignorance allows me to keep living in my sin. He turned to the woman and said, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with now isn't yours. 
or is it your husband? The reality is she continued to it. The Bible tells us that people would prefer darkness rather than light, ignorance rather than knowledge, error, error rather than truth. Why? Because the, people, the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. We want darkness. Let's forget. Let's admit there's a certain amount of enjoyment in sin. We like it. You know, I mean, over the years, I've had I've had young men and women come to me because they were upset because they were sleeping with their girlfriend, and their boyfriend. They knew it was wrong, and they wanted to, they wanted to confess. And when confess, I said, "You gonna stop?" And they say, "No." I've had people who have dealt with unbelief and anger at somebody, and they've let it build and build and build, and we go, they come to me and we talk about it, and I had to tell them they need to repent of it, and I ask them, are you going to do that? And no. And I go on and on. Why? Because there's an enjoyment in sin. If it wasn't, nobody would do it. The reality is, is that ignorance keeps me from having to face that and deal with it. Second thing it does, it allows me to be in charge. Because if I don't know what God wants, guess who's job, who I'm going to listen to? I'm going to listen to myself. If I don't take and apply God's word to it, I'm going to apply my own word to it. And I like that. I want to be in charge. I want to say who I'm to forgive and not to forgive, who I'm to love and now I'm not to love, who I'm to serve and who I'm not to serve. I want to be the one who says, I would, this is the sacrifice I want to make and this is the sacrifice I don't want to make. I like that. And so we, we seek to be in charge of our lives. And the more that we stay ignorant of God's word, the easier that is. The third thing, it keeps us free from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Where God's word is ignored, the promptings of the Holy Spirit are easily ignored. When we casually take, don't take God's word into our life, it's very easy not to listen to the Holy Spirit. I mean... Let's be honest. Now, you got to be honest here, okay? You ever done something and really been convicted about that's not good, that was wrong, and, and God just really hit you upside the head of two by four? If you have, raise your hand, okay? If you're not raising your hand, you're lying, okay? I don't like that feeling, do you? I don't like that. I don't like it when God convicts me of something. But that's good for me, and it's healthy for me. And the Scripture says those that he loves, he disciplines. And if you're not with discipline, that means you're not of God. But that means I like it. So what is the easiest way? If I just ignore God, then I don't hear it. If I just push God off the side and his word off the side, I just don't study it. Guess what? It's easy to overlook. Number four, we seek wrong things. I had a friend in Milford who I started riding horses with. And we would go out and ride horses and every every probably once or twice a week and we uh did that all summer long and then it started getting fall and a couple other things came up and I got busy so I didn't get to go out riding with him very much and he stopped coming to church. And I went to him and I said, Why are you not coming to church? And this was his honest answer. He said, I was not looking for a church. I was looking for a friend. And when I couldn't do what he wanted, it was time to move on. So I got a question for you. What are you looking for today? What are you here for? You looking for friends? Be with your friends, people you like? Are you, are you looking to find an answer to a problem? I mean, that's not bad. Are you looking to let people know that, hey, I'm a good person, I show up to church? The reality is, are you coming here today for your Savior? To draw close to Him. Because if you come to church looking for friends, you'll find them. If you come to church looking for an answer, you'll find it. But it's only when you come to find Jesus that you get what you need. It's only when we come to find Jesus that we truly get what we need, that we truly find God. 
And then he, because people, they become ignorant because people do not seek to apply God's word to their life. And that's where I use the illustration. And how many times will we say we're like that first cup? We hear the Bible's word, we listen to the message, we go home, dump it back out, and five minutes later after we leave. I mean, this afternoon, look at your spouse or look at your brother or sister or parents and say, what was today's sermon about? A lot of times they'll look at you and say, I'm not sure. Report it back. Report it back. You know, we do this when we preach sermons that do not convict our souls. We do this in church when we have hearers that do not observe the word, who are either too distracted to hear it or truth really don't want to hear it. We do this when we take God's word for granted. And we just come and leave and come and leave and come and leave and there's no change. How do we overcome spiritual ignorance? Now, you guys know the answer to this one. I mean, this is simple as it gets. Number one, we seek God. First and foremost, if you want to deal with spiritual ignorance, seek God. Why? Because Jeremiah tells us that we should seek God for he has good plans for you. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plan for your welfare, not for disaster. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And that's where we stop, most of us. We like Jeremiah 29, 11. We forget 12 and 13. For you will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. How? You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Until we're ready to search for God with all our heart. Not partially, not half distracted, not when it feels like it. You're not going to find him. Jesus says it this way. He says, seek me first above everything, but seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be provided. But what's the first part? Seek. Proverb tells us to seek God like we would silver or gold. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your hearts to understanding, Furthermore, if you call out to the inside and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Seek it. Dig for it. Grab hold of it. Go to God and say, God, I want you in my life. I want to know you. And don't let God off of it. Don't stop. In the book of one of the prophets, I think it's Jeremiah, but I'm not positive, so I won't guarantee it. It says, continue 24 hours a day to harass God until God responds. I think that's exactly what we should be doing. Don't let go until God gives you himself. Until God gives you his spirit, his love, and his commitment. Second of all, read and meditate on his word. Another quote from Luther. He who loses sight of the word of God falls in despair. The voice of heaven no longer sustains him. He follows only the disorderly tendency of his heart. You know, people like that, one day they're here, next day they're here, the next day they're here. They'll say one thing, and then two days later they'll say the exact opposite. They're bouncing all over the place. It's like hitting that whack-a-mole thing. You never know where they're going to pop up next. Because if we don't have the Word of God centered in our heart, you're going to follow anything. The Word of God, the power of God, the presence of God, the love of God, the Spirit of God is not centered first in our heart. We're going to be all over the place. And we see it in our lives. I'll just focus on me, your word alone. I'm going to close with one more quote from Luther. I just thought this was a great one. Heaven and earth, all the emperors, the kings, and the princes of the world. We could change that to politicians, Bill Gates, and entertainers. Could not raise a fit dwelling place for God, no matter how much money you got. Yet in a weak human soul, 
that keeps his word, he willingly resigns. Spiritual ignorance literally will kill you. They tell you that what you don't know can't hurt you. That's a lie. It'll kill you. But God will reside with the weakest, most struggling Christian in the world who seeks to keep his word. Sovereignly, I think. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus from this day forward to life everlasting. Amen.